you can go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay. So um, welcome everyone to the session on oblivious structures, key exchange and group messaging. Um, the first talk is about a lower bound for one round oblivious from by David Cash, Andrew Drucker and Alex Hoover and Alexander is going to give the talk. Thanks. Yeah. So today I'll be talking about a lower bound for one round oblivious RAM. So the setting we're concerned with is one where a client has some potentially encrypted data on some untrusted server and doesn't want an adversary on the server uh, figuring out what type of operations the client is doing to that data. And so the one general primitive for this is called oblivious RAM introduced by Goldrick Ostrowski which uh, takes as input some operations from a client, converts them into physical operations on a server. And uh, hopefully these physical operations are independent of whatever program the client is, is running. Uh, and so that this is secure against an adversary uh, looking at the server. And um, so I'll go over two really quick, simple ORAM. Uh, one is just kind of the read everything ORAM that has insane overhead. It just accesses the entire server every single time a client requests something. Um, and we say this has overhead in. Uh, another simple ORAM is one that just holds the entire array locally and doesn't touch the server at all. Um, and we say this has local storage or state in. Um, and this just maintains the array uh, for the client locally. Uh, there's been a long line of work. I can only list a few here uh, for constructions on ORAM uh, that bring it all the way down to the optimal uh, O log in. Uh, unfortunately, these like logarithmic constructions uh, pretty much all use uh, order login rounds in order to achieve that low overhead. They're highly adaptive. Um, on the other hand, uh, the lower bounds um, don't really take into account rounds, uh, at least not the known ones. And so the line of work there is a bit shorter. Goldor Kostrowski proved that statistically secure Bolson and Bins over M require a login amortized overhead. Will Noor uh, point out that there are still some open there were still some open problems uh, after the Goldar Kostrowski lower bound, namely like against computationally bounded adversaries and in an information theoretic model, uh, both of which are answered by Larson Nielsen two years later and extended one more time to a setting with a weaker adversary uh, a year after that. Uh, but in this work, we're more concerned about the round complexity of ORAM. Specifically, we're wondering how efficient a one round ORAM can be. So you just have one round to go and grab things from the server and then you're back. And what we prove is that there's a trade-off between rounds, bandwidth, and state for ORAM. And we prove a bandwidth memory trade-off for one round balls and bins ORAM, uh, which is actually tight up to logarithmic factors with the matching construction being a uh, warm-up construction from the Goldar Kostrowski original paper uh, that I kind of recap a little bit in the longer talk. Uh, and this is a statement or one statement of our main result that any one round balls and ORAM with R cells of state and uh, P overhead, but he must uh, obey this trade-off, at least when the overhead is small. And the way we prove this in the paper is um, by con contradiction. We uh, assume there's some ORAM that doesn't, behave, doesn't obey this trade-off, and we just uh, give an adversary attacking this ORAM. Uh, so the adversary just submits two sequences that are the exact same up until the very final operation. And this final operation is either a repeated read or it's some uniformly random read. And uh, what we prove is that if it's a repeated read, then uh, it will freshly overlap with some target read previous, some previous target read. And if it's a random read, then it will not freshly overlap uh, with high probability. The way we managed to do this is uh, we prove that if the ORAM doesn't have enough local state and it, because it's not adaptive, this final read is gonna have to access the physical cell where the ball was originally located because it can't remember uh, what happened before this final operation. And it's kind of really interesting getting there and that's kind of the subtlety of the argument, um, but I can't cover it here. Uh, and in the second sequence, this final read is random and independent of the target that we select from the previous reads. And so the, and each of these physical cells can be accessed for the first time at most once. So it can only freshly overlap with at most P previous reads. And so if we pick enough previous reads to randomly select the target in, then uh, the, the final read is gonna freshly overlap with the target with uh, probability at most C, which is like one over a thousand. 
uh, we do leave open a few problems, uh, namely an extension for the other half of the trade-off. We only show the trade-off when the overhead is small, so less than C times root n. Also an extension from balls and bins to the information theoretic model, much like Larson Nielsen did, is open. We uh, point out some of the issues there and an extension to K round ORAM in general beyond one round um, is still open. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Alex, for uh, for the great talk. And even even with the proof sketch in five minutes, that's awesome. Um, yeah, um, you can ask questions um, either verbally or in the chat or uh, in the Julep, Julep chat. Oh, I see uh, um, Mike uh, uh, has a question. Uh, do you want to unmute yourself and, and ask the question? Sure. Um, so, hi, Alex. So you gave a nice uh, intuition about the client forgetting where it put some item. Um, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering where that breaks down in the case that there's a multiple rounds to the ORAM protocol. So in the case of a multiple round, uh, it's really like, because it's adaptive, right? So I can go and access a single cell and then like, depending on what's in that cell, I could do like if they're in balls in the system. I could do in different things with my next access until like it blows up really quickly on how many like uh, different possible accesses you could do. But if you're not adaptive at all, then uh, when the ORAM get, receives the final operation, it's completely fixed what cells it's gonna access by the state and by the operation that's requested. There's no adaptivity to it at all. So it sounds like you can get maybe a really bad, exponentially bad bound for multiple round ORAMs just by the analysis yes. you mentioned, but it's probably not a useful bound. Yeah, yeah, it's not, it's not too interesting. Thank you. One more quick okay. question. Yeah. Maybe we can have our next uh, speaker start sharing their screen while uh, um, we wait for another question. All right, I think let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and start uh, the next uh, next talk. So the next talk here is lower bounds for multi-server oblivious RAMs. Uh, uh, this is by Casper Green Larson, uh, Mark Simkin, and Kevin Yo, and uh, Kevin will give the talk. All right, thanks for the introduction. So uh, yes, today I'll be talking about lower bounds for multi-server oblivious RAMs, and this is a co a joint work with Casper Green Larson and Mark Mark Simkin from Aarhus University. So I think oblivious RAMs were already introduced in the last talk, but to quickly describe what it is, it was introduced by Goldreich and Ostrovsky. And the idea sort of is you have a client on the left, a server on the right that sort of holds n array entries. And it's a very simple sort of data structure. What you want is the, the client wants to access the ith entry. It'll do some sequence of operations in some complex way to get the ith entry. But what should really happen is the server shouldn't know what the requested index was. So it should not have in, of knowledge of what I was. And in particular, what the server sees is something encapsulated by this red box. So for example, it knows what's, what's stored on the server. They may be encrypted, they may be permuted, and they also see whatever is being accessed by the client at any point in time. So more formally, what, uh, so what we're gonna study in this paper more formally are, are these things called multi-server ORAMs. So you can imagine having sort of K servers, but only one of the servers is adversarial. So only one of the servers is trying to learn the index I. The, K, the remaining K minus one are actually not adversarial, they're not storing any information, they're not, they're not doing anything. Of course, it's very important that the client doesn't know which of the servers is adversary. If it did, it can just use a non-adversarial server to do these requests immediately. So it turns out for multi-server ORAM, there are two very uh, trivial solutions that are on the opposite end of the spectrum of privacy and efficiency. So the trivial algorithm one, the client gets index I. What it can do is just do a plain text query to a random, one of the random case servers. This costs order one overhead. In fact, you just, you just say, give the index I and retrieve the index from that server. But really what you're playing with is, is hoping that the random server that you chose is, uh, has, has is not being uh, compromised by the adversary. So 
the adversary's advantage is essentially one over k. It just has to hope that the, the client picked the compromised adversary. So the second very trivial algorithm is actually using these single server ORAMs. So like was described in the previous uh, talk, there are logarithmic overhead overhead ORAMs, and you can just you don't even remember you don't you don't even you ignore the other k minus one servers. You pick a server and just do an ORAM query with it. And you know if that server is is compromised or not, you you get privacy with better than one over k. You get negligible advantage, but you have logarithmic overhead, and you're not really using the power of the fact that k minus one of these servers are really not compromised. So in our work, what we'll end up proving is the following main result. Essentially, we show that any multi-server oblivious ORAM with k servers, where the adversary compromises just one server, it must have omega log n overhead, so it's equivalent to the single server ORAM, when you want distinguishing advantage at most 1 over 4k. So I want to quickly uh, say that for this theorem, it also immediately implies any result where the adversary compromises more than one server already, because that's it's harder to construct than just when the adversary compromises one server. And there are also two very strong corollaries that immediately apply. So the first one is that if you consider any multi-server ORAM with negligible advantage, you know, the, the typical security guarantee that we want from an ORAM, it requires log n overhead, even with a polynomial number of servers. So like, just think about that for a second. You have like, you know, n squared, n to the hundred sort of servers. Only one of them is, uh, is, is compromised. You still require log n to get negligible advantage. So this is a very strong result. It essentially shows that multi-server ORAMs in any practical setting probably are not useful compared to single server ORAM. I, I, call, I, I caveat this by saying this is a theoretical result. Maybe practically you can improve constants and whatnot, but sort of theoretically it's all you can do. And the second cool result we show is that actually the two trivial algorithms, you know, the one where you sort of do a single request blindly in plain text and you get one over K advantage. So that's optimal for the setting where you want distinguishing advantage. You're okay with that one over K advantage. On the other hand, if you want anything slightly less than one over 4K, you must use a, the, essentially the overhead of a single server ORAM, and that ends up being optimal. So we sort of show that you know there's nothing in between. You know you either do one or you do the other, and sort of I, I just wanted to sort of get out that these two corollaries end up being very strong results of our main theorem. Um, so I think I have a couple of minutes, so I can I didn't I wasn't planning to give a sketch of the talk, but of uh, the proof, but sort of at a high level, the way the proof goes is we use the information transfer technique of Larson and Nielsen that was at Crypto 18, and the the, the main uh, sort of improvement that we have to do on top of that proof is essentially we have to strengthen the adversary. The adversary in that case is single server, so it sees all probes to the data structure. In this case, you have a server that's seeing, you know, one over K fraction of the of the probes. And it should it's it turns out that's still enough. You just have to be careful about how the adversary sort of constructs its app, its sort of distinguishing advantage and, and utilizes it. But uh, I don't I wouldn't have time to to sort of go into the details and I point everyone to the, the YouTube talk or the full paper for more details. Uh, I guess are there any questions? Thanks. We have a couple of minutes uh, for questions. Uh, so yeah, go ahead and post questions on Zulip or uh, raise your hand here on Zoom if you want to um, ask uh, ask on video. Um, well, I'm not uh, seeing any questions on on Zulip or on uh, on Zoom. I guess uh, all that. I mean, I think it was an excellent uh, excellent talk. Uh, so I'll go ahead and pipe in with a quick uh, quick question of my own. Um, uh, so can can you say uh, just a little bit more, uh, maybe about some of the extra technical challenges uh, to, I guess, extend some of these uh, information theoretic uh, proofs uh, to uh, the multi-server setting? Like, what uh, what kind of techniques did you the DNA is. Right. So essentially, uh, the main sort of new tool that was used in this proof is the idea that you can sort of slice the distribution of what is seen by the adversary into small chunks that are sort of logarithmically growing in size. Hmm. So essentially, before in the Larson Nielsen proof, there was a simple upper bound that was considered. And you know, if you're beyond it, 
you can distinguish if you're below it, you can distinguish. And essentially this proof requires breaking down that support of the distribution into sort of logarithmically or exponentially increasing size spaces, checking whether you're in that sort of disjoint partition. And even if you sort of are at the very end of the partition, you lose a factor of two. So this sort of proof loses a factor of two, but theoretically we don't care. And that's sort of the main ingredient of the new proof. All right. Thanks. Um, I guess uh, we can probably uh, move on to our next uh, next speaker. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Great. Okay. Great. Um, uh, I can see your slides. All right. So um, um, the next talk is on computational shortcuts for information theoretic private information retrieval by Matthew Hong, Yuval Hishai, Victor Kolobov, and Russell Lai. And Matthew is going to give the talk. Hi, everyone. So my name is Matthew, and this is on computational shortcuts for information theoretic PRR. And this is John work with Yuval Hishai, Victor Kolobov, and Russell Lai. So packet information retrieval is a building block of low communication, multi-party computation. And we'll focus on information theoretic PRR, not just because they are unconditionally secure, but also because of their good con concrete complexities for small to moderate domains. So these schemes are actually very practical for domain size up to millions of data records in the database. PRR protocols consist of a single client who holds an index to a database and who wishes to achieve a bid without having the index revealed to the servers. So he apply a secret sharing that's split into K parts. Each of these is turned to an output share by a local evaluation algorithm on the server. And the server will send all of these results back to the client for the decoding. In our talk, we'll assume the schemes to be perfectly correct and one private, whereby one privacy, we mean each input uh, share has a distribution that is independent of the original index. And we also assume the scheme to have certain efficiency features such as coming with outputs that are very short and it allows some simple decoding, which is often a simple addition over the output group followed by some post-processing. We can also consider other settings and this is just for simplicity in our presentation. So there are roughly three generations of K-Server PR protocols where the first and second generation achieves an input share size that's sublinear in the size of the database for a constant number of servers. And for the third generation matching vector-based protocols, this is greatly improved to a polynomial communication and for the middle of three or even two servers. Yeah, so before we introduce the notion of computational shortcuts, let's view PRR in an alternative homomorphic secret sharing view. So actually, PRR are homomorphic secret sharing, which are secret sharing that supports evaluation of an arbitrary function. But this function is represented by a truth table. So you can view the database as a truth table of a certain function and apply PRR to it. And this way, the, the client can achieve can retrieve the function evaluated on the private input i. This will give us a natural way to construct new information theoretic homomorphic secret sharing. And given that there are relatively few homomorphic secret sharing in the literature, we can, uh, this is a valuable approach. But the bottleneck of this approach is that the local computation is always linear in the size of the truth table in the PR protocols. So it can show, be shown that this is always intrin also intrinsic for, an, for random database. So what if the database is structured in some sense, say they come from a simple functions? If we can obtain PR shortcuts that run in a much better time for a structured database like this, then this will imply IT homomorphic secret sharing scheme with us faster evaluation time. So we carry out this plan and, and show that in the first generation, we will appear out where the share size is sublinear in the database size. We can construct shortcuts for simple but useful function families, including, for example, union of L intervals. And here we can obtain the strongest possible shortcuts in the sense that the computational complexity is linear in the input to the local server. So this is the input share size and the function representation. And this is the strongest possible because it is already linear in the local input. So let's consider an application. We can actually generalize these uh, shortcuts to any dimension, higher dimension, like 2D dimensional uh, intervals and 
Here we can consider an application URL minus, and you want to know the types of mineral available at your location privately. And you can view the truth table as a, like this, like zero stands for nothing and one stands for gold, etc. But you don't have the database actually, and you want to hide your location. So actually, we can apply remote PR for this setting and obtain a shortcut that runs in a square root of n times uh, plus L, where L is the number of intervals instead of the naive evaluation time of capital N. And the core idea is very simple, actually. It is based on polynomial factoring. So I will just give a very brief idea here. So the local input to the service consists of two vectors, each of length square root of N over a field. And the service is required to compute a degree two polynomial, which sums over all the terms corresponding to non-zero values in the database. So say for this region, we can see that there are nine summation here. But actually, since there are now rectangles, we can do the factoring and obtain a sum that multiply operation. This will just take square root of n time. And we can extend this for L intervals and, and obtain a shortcut that runs in like a multiplicative overhead in L. But actually, this can be improved to an additive overhead in L by taking first the prefix sums. And each of these summation is just a difference of two prefix sums. So now for each interval, we can do a constant time for the retrieval of, of the responses. Our results also extend to higher dimensional intervals when, whenever the dimension divides the number of servers minus one. And it is still open whether we can obtain shortcuts for other dimensions. And the smallest open case is when D and K both equals to three. And for decision tree over n variables, we obtain so-called weak shortcuts that are weak in the sense that it's not the strongest possible. And we can slightly improve it to, to other complexity, uh, to other alternative algorithms that are incomparable. And it is still open whether we can further improve this factor to a constant leading to a strong shortcut for these season trees. Yeah, so when we move to harder functions where the number of ones in the true table is difficult to count, such as constant death circuits, then everything is hard there. And you can, you can show that falsify, uh, if you can obtain shortcuts, it will falsify the exponential time hypothesis, which is widely used in factoring complexity. And when we move to matching vector case, everything is hard. And it is hopeful, hopeless to even obtain shortcuts for the own functions. This tells us that hardness comes from the structure of the matching vector and not from the function. Yeah, finally, and we present some circumvention by increasing the number of servers or having more communication. So thank you for coming to our talk, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thanks for the nice talk. And yeah, a uh, question. Kevin just reposted also the link to the Zulip chat if you want to ask questions there. Um, maybe I can start with a with a question of my own. So. Um, so to to improve that finding computational shortcuts um, implies falsifying the um, exponential time hypothesis or strong exponential time hypothesis. Um, do you somehow need to deal with mm, worst case to average case things, or um, I let me think. I, I I think we don't have to and. This is because, so our shortcut, say for this shortcut, uh, for, the hardness, for this hardness, we show that uh, obtaining a shortcut would imply counting the number of ones in a database for any database. And, uh -huh. and, and if the number, if the database corresponds to a constant death circuit, say, or a CNF formula, then you can actually count the number of ones by a shortcut. And a shortcut that runs in a sublinear time would falsify the strong exponential time hypothesis. I see. So because it's for um, every database, um, you solve all the instances as you yeah, need to. Yeah. For, yeah. OK, nice. Nice. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Uh, all right, then, uh, uh, thank you again. Maybe uh, uh, Alexander can already share his slides. Yes, that works. 
Okay. All right. Uh, great. Uh, so yeah, we can see the see the screen. Uh, so next talk is uh, on the price of concurrency and group ratcheting protocols. Um, so this is uh, um, by uh, Alexander, uh, Evgeny, and Paul, and uh, Alex will give the talk. All right. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, sorry. Okay. So uh, in group ratcheting, uh, we have a group of users whose goal is to compute joint keys over time for some higher level applications, such as secure group messaging. Uh, such protocols occur in the face of an adversary who may temporarily expose local states of users across time. This is applicable to real world scenarios, such as group messaging involving long-term sessions with mobile devices that are susceptible to such exposures. One can observe that these exposures leak the group key until all local states have recovered somehow. So ideally, we want post-compromise security, or PCS, via small protocol recovery messages that can be broadcast concurrently in order to regain security of the group key as quickly as possible. For otherwise, if the protocol does not allow concurrency, recovery will be slower as messages need to be sent sequentially. And also, we would need some sort of consensus mechanism for resolving the concurrency that still naturally arises, which is not good for decentralization. Previous works in the, in the literature were unable to simultaneously achieve PCS small overhead and concurrency. Uh, and the best known in some sense, though you should look at the full paper for a more extensive comparison, were protocols with so-called fair weather big O of log N overhead that still have big O of N in the worst case, and moreover still require some sort of, uh, or sorry, moreover uh, still only have partial concurrency, uh, meaning they still require some sort of consensus. Uh, and our work shows that in order to have PCS with T concurrency, meaning T users sending at the same time, uh, big omega of T overhead is requir required for each recovery message. And we show this in a weak model with static groups, synchronous rounds, and no required forward secrecy, which of course only strengthens our lower bound. We also show an almost matching big O of T plus T log N over T upper bound in a similar, slightly stronger, stronger model, which also provides FS. So for T equals one concurrency, it has big O of log N overhead, and with T equals N concurrency, it has big O of N overhead, uh, both of which match upper bounds of previous works that tolerate the same level of concurrency. However, an open problem is to make this protocol more realistic, i.e. both dynamic and fully uh, asynchronous. But in this talk, I'll focus on the lower bound. Uh, before providing the intuition for our lower bound, I want to again emphasize that we prove it in the following round-based communication setting, which only makes our lower bound stronger for real, real world protocols that need to, need to handle more asynchronous uh, communication. So communication proceeds in rounds in which at the end of a given round, all users know exactly who sent in the round and receive their corresponding messages. But if they choose to send at the beginning of some round, they don't know who else is also sending at that time. Uh, okay, so now for the intuition, uh, first in some round I minus one, T exposed users must independently communicate new public keys for themselves. And this must be done independently since again, they don't know who else is sending in the round and could in fact be the only one. And moreover, this is all they can do since they don't know who else may be compromised at the time and thus any other public key which they might encrypt secrets to may not be secure. Then the senders in round I must separately communicate secrets to the round I minus one senders because they don't know who the other round I senders are and thus can't coordinate with them to reduce communication. And again, it could in fact be the only sender. Although the omega of T lower bound on communication per sender in round I seems hard to show in general, since maybe round I senders could somehow compress their messages for the uh, round I minus one senders. And in fact, this is exactly what something like N party Nike could allow for. Oops, sorry. Uh, we use a symbolic model, which allows us to bypass such exotic crypto primitives and focus on standard operations. So specifically what we prove is that in our model, establishing secure group keys under T concurrency requires every sent message to have at length at least t, t minus one, where length is a number of symbols in our model. And thus there must be T squared total communication in the group per round. 
And this is argued formally using graph theoretic tools, which I don't have time for now, but you can see it in the full paper presentation. Instead, uh, I'll give some high level details of our symbolic model, which is inspired by MP04. In our model, variables are just symbols without any representation or structure outside of the exact symbol which they denote. Algorithms in the, in the model follow defined transition rules that specify exactly how symbols can be used to derive other symbols. For example, algorithms can sample random coins, which can be used for secret keys, which can be used to generate encryption public keys, which can then be used for encryption and corresponding decryption. Particularly, through these transition rules, we allow constructions to only use a fixed set of standard cryptographic building blocks. Specifically, we allow possibly dual PRFs, also key up the updatable PKE, which we model to be at least as strong as Hyde, and broadcast encryption. And with these primitives, our model covers more than what previous constructions have used. Finally, secure group keys computed by group ratcheting constructions are defined to be those that cannot be obtained by the adversary using the defined transition rules, given the combination of symbols from messages broadcast by users, as well as secrets from corrupted user states. And these are required after all exposed members have sent, and afterwards someone has sent once more. So in conclusion, our contributions are that we get a lower bound of big omega t communication per sending user per PCS under t concurrency, and an almost matching big O of t plus t log n over t upper bound. Uh, so some open problems are, can we close the gap? Uh, can we make the upper bound dynamic and fully asynchronous? Can we show that two and three party Nike can't help in overcoming the lower bound? Uh, can a PCS delay of greater than one round allow protocols to reduce communication? And can we apply the ideas from our upper bound to the MLS group messaging standard? Uh, thanks, that's it. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, we have a couple minutes for questions. So uh, um, go ahead and uh, post on Zulip or, uh, or raise your hand here. Um, I guess I'll, um, I'll start out while we're waiting for, uh, um, for questions to come in. Uh, um, so you mentioned uh, using a symbolic model and I forget which, uh, which primitives you were including there. Um, if yeah. someone included another primitive, how hard it is, how hard it would it be to kind of redo the analysis and prove that the lower bound still still holds? Uh, I mean, I guess it depends on the power. Uh, but basically, I mean, it seems like to overcome the lower bound, you need something at least that's sort of like Nike, which would allow you to combine the public keys from the exposed users. Um, yeah. Okay. Would something like uh, fully homomorphic encryption, even though it may not be uh, maybe a bit more expensive than they want in practice, uh, would that uh, potentially uh, circumvent lower bounds? Uh, I don't think it would, but it's it's very hard to model uh, FHE uh, in this symbolic way because. Uh, like, you know, we use these defined transition rules, but if you have FHE where you can sort of, you know, compute any function over ciphertext, then it seems hard to define the transition rules. Um, okay. um, what's your, <laughs> what's your, what's your uh, gut feeling for how and um, kind of the most efficient um, um, protocol um, for, for this task looks like if you if you have arbitrary is this kind of do you think like this is kind of the the lower bound even if you kind of put a little bit more stronger primitives or, or do you think um, stronger primitives could actually help you? What's your? Uh, I would say that. I mean, of course, like if you have Nike, uh, like I said, it seems sort of trivial. Uh, but besides something like Nike, I think it would, I mean, my gut feeling is that uh, you wouldn't be able to overcome the lower bound. But perhaps you could overcome, uh, like you could improve our upper bound, but I'm not sure about that either. 
so, so kind of the interpretation is more that it's informative for the design. Like if you if you reach this level of efficiency, then maybe you can stop looking. Yeah, and, I think so. Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe some particular assumptions like LWE, if you use a particular algebraic assumptions, so so like FHE it seems like even though we haven't proved it, it seems like it probably wouldn't help, uh, but it's a conjecture. But LWE, for example, I would actually conjecture probably there is some clever protocol, but uh, yeah, it requires uh, some algebraic structure, but I could be wrong. That's a great open question. Um, yeah, LWE would actually be awesome. I mean, like if you're going into this quantum direction anyway. <laughs> um, uh, all right. Um, so then I'd say let's uh, let's move to the uh, next speaker. Uh, Sophia, can you um, put up your slides? Yep. Did that work? Not yet. Oh. Uh, how about oh, now? Oh, very good. Excellent. All right. All right. So um, the next talk is about stronger notions and constructions for multi-designated verifier signatures by Ivan Damgard, Helen Haag, Rebecca Mersa, Anka Nitulescu, Claudio Landi, and Sofia Jakubov. And Sofia is going to give the talk. Uh, thanks so much for the introduction. So this talk is about multi-designated verifier signatures, or MDVS for short. Um, and these are really useful in group messaging. So imagine that we have uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, and they're really used to talking in person. But then along comes a pandemic, and they're forced to use a group messenger. Uh, but these guys really liked talking in person. Uh, and there are a lot of properties of in-person conversation that they'd like to preserve when they go online. So for instance, when Snow White would say something in person, all of the dwarves would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this statement really came from Snow White. So they had unforgeability. All of the dwarves also knew that all of the other dwarves heard the same message that they did. So they also had this consistency property. And finally, they had uh, an off the record guarantee, meaning that not, uh, Snow White knew that none of the dwarves could prove to the evil queen what exactly she said when they talked in person. So multi-designated verifier signatures are designed to give all of these sort of qualities of in-person conversations, uh, but in a digital conversation. So uh, Snow White would have the seven dwarves be the designated verifiers and her signature uh, should convince the seven of them that she signed this message, but it shouldn't be able to convince anyone other than a designated verifier. So anyone outside of the conversation. So there are a number of prior works in this area and they all achieve these properties to uh, varying degrees. Most of the prior works achieve a slightly weaker notion of unforgeability, where any of the designated verifiers, any of the seven dwarves, uh, might actually be able to forge a Snow White signature uh, for their fellow dwarves. And what we want is a little stronger. We want uh, Snow White's signature to convince every dwarf that the sign that signature really came from Snow White. So. On the other hand, consistency is achieved by most prior work, but isn't actually formally defined uh, in any of them. And finally, we have this off the record property, which I mentioned. So what we want is if the evil queen shows up and tries to interrogate the dwarves, even if the dwarves turn over their entire conversation with Snow White and their secret keys, they shouldn't be able to convince the evil queen that Snow White said what she did. And this is defined uh, by requiring that the designated verifiers be able to simulate Snow White's signature. So when the evil queen sees the signature, she shouldn't be able to tell whether it's a real signature from Snow White or something that these uh, dwarves just simulated on her behalf. So um, prior work achieves off the record in, in a limited sense, meaning that 
uh, in order to simulate Snow White's signature, all of the designated verifiers, all of the dwarves have to collaborate to produce the simulation. Uh, but the evil queen might, for instance, know that one of them wasn't available to help out with the simulation. Maybe like Happy the Dwarf was undercover as a spy or something and was out of touch with the rest of the dwarves. And the evil queen knows this. And since she does, if she sees a signature from Snow White, she'll be totally convinced that Snow White said uh, what she said because the dwarves couldn't have collaborated on a simulation. So what we really want here is for any subset of the dwarves to be able to simulate a signature. And that signature should be indistinguishable from a real one from the point of view of the evil queen. But of course, it shouldn't convince the other dwarves uh, that Snow White said this, because then that would be a forgery for those other, other dwarves. Um, so in our paper, we give uh, stronger definitions for multi-designated verifier signatures, including this notion of off the record that's secure against any subset of designated verifiers. And we get the first formal definition of consistency. Uh, so we also give two constructions. One of these uses standard primitives like key exchange, max, and PRFs. And the second one uses functional encryption. And it might sound silly to be using functional encryption when we can do what looks like the same thing from more standard tools. Uh, but actually, the functional encryption construction uh, comes with some additional uh, perks, which we describe in a little bit of detail in the longer version of this talk and in a lot of detail in the paper. Uh, so that's all I want to say uh, here. Thanks all for listening. Yeah. Thanks for the great introduction to this um, paper. Questions by anyone? Can I ask directly without typing it in? So what about uh, collusion? What if some of the dwarfs collude with the evil queen? Is that outside of the model or is that, does that even make sense? Um, so they're absolutely allowed to collude. Um, we're assuming that uh, the dwarf simulation of Snow White's signature should be indistinguishable from a real signature, even given all of the dwarf secrets. So that they can collude with each other with the evil queen. And even if they collude and try their best, they shouldn't be able to convince the evil queen. Does that make sense? Yep, cool, that's perfect. Okay. Um, so in my, in my mind, there is an apparent contradiction. Um, uh, so so the, uh, the dwarves um, should, um, should not be able to create forgeries towards other drafts, drafts. Um, yeah. but they are able to, 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 to collude. So how, 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 so, how do I resolve this? So there, there's a lot of tension between this like unforgeability property and the, the off the record property, right? So dwarves should absolutely not be able to fool other dwarves, but at the same time, I'm saying that like any subset of dwarves should be able to simulate a signature that verifies given their secrets. So the key here is that if I, as a dwarf, participated in a simulation, uh, the simulation I help produce is allowed to verify under my verification key. But for anyone who didn't contribute to the simulation, who didn't participate, uh, the simulation shouldn't be a forgery. It shouldn't ver verify under their verification key. OK, thank you. So my. So my confusion there is maybe then, what if that dwarf that didn't participate in the simulation, what if that is the dwarf that colludes with the queen? Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's a really tricky scenario. We're kind of assuming that the evil queen isn't allowed to break our dwarves into sort of two non-communicating groups and interrogate them separately. Like we're assuming that if a dwarf doesn't participate in the simulation, uh, then he's not available to the evil queen either, basically. Uh, there was, um, 
I remember we had a very compelling argument for why it wouldn't be possible to achieve this stronger notion of security against two like non-communicating sets of dwarves, but I don't remember what it was at the, at the moment. Maybe we could talk offline. How interactive are your solutions? How interactive are um, so the signatures are totally non-interactive. When uh, when the, when Snow White signs a message, she does that locally. She sends the message off to, to the dwarves. Everything uh, works non-interactively. Simulation, uh, as far as I recall, will have to be pretty interactive because there are some zero knowledge proofs that need to be computed there. Though so actually, I think, I suspect it has to be inter uh, interactive, but at the moment I'm having a, a few doubts. Like maybe we can do it a little, a little better. So this is maybe an odd question for TCC, but uh, um, have you tried, uh, you know, implementing this? Like how how close to practical is the the construction? So. Uh, in our paper, in addition to the two constructions, uh, we show a lower bound on the signature size in a scheme that meets our definitions, which is O of N for N being the number of verifiers. So that um, is a little bit of a downside. Uh, but that said, our more practical construction from like standard primitives uh, should be fairly efficient to build for, uh, especially for like smaller mess uh, messaging groups. Okay, thanks. Um, so I guess uh, uh, we can probably have our next uh, um, speaker, um, uh, Marta, uh, share uh, share our screen, and then uh, um, yeah, we'll uh, move on and take any questions if we have time at the end. Um, okay, so the next uh, um, uh, next presentation is a continuous group key agreement with active security. Uh, uh, so this is by uh, Joel Alwyn, uh, Sandro uh, Coretti, uh, Daniel uh, Yost, and uh, Marta. And uh, Marta will give the talk. Okay, thank you. Uh, so this is about secure group messaging, or two talks ago it was called uh, group ratcheting. Uh, so this basically generalizes the well-known two-party secure messaging, sometimes called ratcheting, to groups. Uh, and so the goal is to uh, allow a large dynamic group of users to uh, exchange messages. Uh, and we want some confidentiality, even if the secrets of these users can continuously leak. Uh, so one such protocol is actually currently being standardized by this MLS working group. So now continuous group key agreement or CGKA is basically the core primitive used to build uh, SGM. So in a sense, it does for secure group messaging what key exchange does for TLS. Uh, it's also part of the MLS protocol where it's called, uh, the, their CGKA protocol is called Trika. So the goal is to uh, allow a dynamic group to agree on a sequence of shared symmetric keys. Uh, so really the way you should think about CGKA is that it creates um, a bunch of epochs where in each epoch we have a fixed set of group members who share a symmetric key and they can use this key to encrypt messages to the group. And the two important properties that we want is that it's not interactive. So this means that an epoch can be changed by sending just one message to the group. Uh, and it should be efficient, so the message size should be um, logarithmic in the group size or fair weather logarithmic. So this is the functionality that we want. Now, what about security? Uh, so we add target adversaries that continuously leak states, as I said. Uh, they fully control the network. So this is asynchronous. It includes injecting, reordering, dropping messages, and we model bad randomness generators. Uh, and all of these call, all of these uh, adversaries powers are kind of explicitly considered uh, in standards like MLS. So in this setting, the goal is basically to protect as many epochs as possible. So you can think of this safety predicate that takes an execution where messages are sent, parties are corrupted and so on, uh, and an epoch created in this execution and that decides whether it's secure for your protocol uh, or not. The, shared key in this epoch. And this should be true as often as possible. So this generalizes the well-known properties of forward secrecy and post-compromise security. So to be a bit more concrete, I have an example. So if Cindy's state uh, 
so I seen this state leaks uh, in epoch two. This inherently creates some window of compromise, but for forward secrecy, we want that past epochs like epoch one are not affected. And for post compromise security, we want that if a uh, syndic goes online and sends and updates um, and sends a message and updates the state, then security is restored. So this is post compromise security. Of course, this is uh, asynchronous. So it could be that people send messages unaware of each other. So this is an example of that. Uh, now, there are two alternative epochs because Alice uh, decided to add Dave and Cindy updated at the same time. And people from epoch five cannot talk to people from epoch four. Uh, so this creates what we call a group split. Uh, so this is the intuition. Now, there have been uh, a bunch of great works that make this formal. Um, unfortunately, all of them are not fully satisfactory uh, because they relied on one of these, on at least one of these two uh, simplifying assumptions. The first one we called the non-splitting assumption on, or NSA, which basically means that uh, these splits, as I showed on the previous slide, don't appear. Uh, the second one, more severe, we called cannot inject assumption or CIA, which basically means that the adversary doesn't inject messages or stays passive. Uh, so this is present in all previous works it, and it contradicts explicit standards or explicit goals of the, um, uh, for example, MLS standard. And it also cannot be achieved by simply adding signatures because if the party state leaks, uh, then it's reasonable to assume that the signing keys also leak, so everything leaks. And at this point in time, the, advers the active network adversary can inherently impersonate the party. So this brings me to our contribution, which is first of all, to give the first definition of full active security for CGKA. So we don't rely on CIA or NSA. As I said, this is an explicit call, never considered before. Um, it's not trivial, for example, it's not, uh, clear how to generalize the uh, two-party active security, which we know how to define. Uh, this is roughly because um, in the two-party case, in case of an active impersonation, there is not much we can guarantee anymore. So it's kind of game over, um, while this is not true in the group setting. So we go a long way towards modeling malicious insiders, not all the way there because we oversimplify PKI. Um, Okay, so as our second contribution, we propose a bunch of protocols that achieve optimal safety predicates. So every epoch that can be protected given correctness actually is. Uh, the first protocol is for the passive setting here. Interestingly, all the current approaches actually don't achieve uh, optimal security if we allow group splits. So we had to do something else. Uh, yeah, and the latter two protocols are for the full active setting, uh, proved in different models, one adaptive, one not and one with more robustness. So thank you. That's that's all I have to say. All right. Thanks. We have uh, time for a couple questions. Uh, so go ahead and uh, ask uh, um, in Zulip or here in uh, Zoom's chat. So I guess I can stop sharing, right? Um, sure, I, yeah. I can put this, I don't know. <laughs> So, okay, uh, I guess on a um, fun level, uh, I assume the uh, um, acronym CIA, NSA were intentional. Uh, one was actually not, one was accidental, and then the second one was um, intentional. <laughs> <laughs> so I was wondering whether um, you could say something about how um, the um, non-splitting assumption, like the fact that you have group splits, um, kind of um, makes these other protocols insecure? Uh, yes, so uh, here is the split. So, so basically, um, the point is that in, in these protocols, if you have, um, if you corrupt someone in epoch four, then you can uh, learn something about epoch five, and this is not inherent. So you can, uh, this, um, so because the group states, the, the, epoch changes only affect part of the group state, then these siblings share state. And so by corrupting one state, you can, you can learn something about uh, one state, you can learn something about the, the other one. And this is, this is not inherent. So, so you might be able to right. protect against that. Right, right, cool. That's, that's very nice observation. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you have to, yes. Yeah, so, so because of this, even if you have an inefficient protocol that uses pairwise channels, 
uh, to to broadcast the key, this won't work because you only like update some parts of the channels, right? Not not the whole network. Right. So. Okay, well, I don't see any uh, any more questions, so I guess perhaps we can have our last uh, speaker of the session, uh, Victor, uh, share, uh, share a screen. Okay. Okay, so, um, right, so this is a security analysis of SPAKE2+. So let's talk about what some of these letters mean here. PAKE means password authenticated key exchange. S means, I don't know, maybe simple. This is a scheme by Abdal and Poincheval from 2005. Um, you can look at the scheme. I don't have time to talk about much of anything. Um, one of the, it, they, they proved that this is secure uh, under the computational Diffie-Hellman assumption and uh, modeling this hash function here as a random oracle. Um, what does security mean? Well, the essential property or one key property that any password authenticated key exchange protocol should offer is that um, it shouldn't be, uh, it should be resilient against offline dictionary attacks, meaning that uh, an adversary who either eavesdrops the protocol or even actively participates in the protocol shouldn't be able to then uh, go off and, and do an offline uh, search for the, for the password. Um, so one problem with this protocol, nice and simple as it is, is that if you look at it, you'll see that both parties, P and Q here, actually need to know the password pi to actually run the protocol. So what this means is that, say, if one of these parties, say Q is a server, its password file actually has to contain the password itself. So that means that if the server is, say, compromised, uh, and the password file is lost, then actually all security is lost since the password is out there. Um, so that's um, kind of a weakness in this, this protocol and a number of other PAKE protocols that people have studied. Um, what I wanted to do is to see how to tweak this simple protocol to, to make it have some resilience against this type of compromise. So that's where the plus comes from to add some resilience. And uh, the goal here is to uh, provide a certain level of security, namely that even if the password file is leaked, the adversary still has to carry out an offline dictionary attack in order to impersonate the client to the server. So breaking into the server and getting the password file all by itself is not enough. Uh, the adversary still has to, to, to do some work. Um, and so you can uh, basically see the, the overall structure of this. The password pi here is passed through a, a hash function, which is treated as a random oracle. And we get these two uh, numbers here. This, the client stores both of these numbers. Well, actually he doesn't store it, he derives it. If he's a human user, he'll derive these numbers from the, his memorized password. The server is gonna store in the password file, not these two numbers, he'll store the first number, and then a one-way function applied to the second number. Well, more specifically, he's going to take that second number and raise G to that second number. Um, and um, so you can see that intuitively, um, uh, if you don't know the password and you can't plug, if you don't know the password and you've never plugged it into this hash function, then you just then this phi one is just a discrete, a random discrete log. Um, and the idea is that um, the intuition of this protocol is that the client has to kind of prove that he knows this phi one uh, to the server. So that's what kind of adds a bit of asymmetry to it. Um, so that's the protocol. And um, um, what uh, I presented this protocol a number of years ago, both in a paper that I wrote with uh, uh, Cash and Kilts and also with a, a book that I've been writing for a couple of decades with Dan Bonet. Um, it's currently being, a variant of this is currently being standardized. And although I claimed in both of these sources that it does provide this resilience, I never actually gave a proof. 
So out of some sense of guilt, I, I, I decided to try to write a, a proof for this. Um, so I was able to prove that um, it was secure in the, in the UC model, which is kind of the most natural model to, to prove these types of results under the same assumptions, computational diffuse helmet assumption and the random oracle assumption. Couple of caveats. First, I wasn't able to actually prove that this protocol is secure in the UC model. I had to tweak it a little bit. Specifically, I had to add some key confirmation flows to it. P pretty straightforward standard stuff. But with those extra flows, then you could prove security. One other caveat is that while this protocol with the key confirmation satisfies kind of the original quote unquote classical definition for asymmetric uh, opaque security, um, introduced some years ago. Um, it doesn't satisfy the, the more recent, stronger definition uh, satisfied by uh, newer protocols like OPAC. Specifically, this protocol and a lot of other protocols like it um, uh, are subject to a pre-computation attack where um, if the server runs through the whole dictionary, at least for a given uh, pair of client server pair, he can pre-compute all these values and then when he logs into the server, he can just do a table lookup. Um, so at least on a, for targeted users, he can do a pre-processing attack that will make it easier to recover uh, the password after post-compromise. Anyway, I'm already way over time. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, Victor. Um, Maybe I can right jump in with a question. Uh, so, um, can you um, can you give us some 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 idea of what um, resilience against password file compromise kind of means in 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 practice? A password file leaks. Right. Then... So in this, right. So in this case, uh, so for this particular protocol, when if the server is compromised, then the adversary gets to see this phi zero and this group element C. And what he's um, so it's it's kind of a subtle point here. One so once if once the adversary obtains this information, he knows everything that the server knows. So he can so the adversary can impersonate himself to an uh, unsuspecting client, right? However, what you wanna prevent, or you, wanna, you wanna say that it's difficult for the adversary now to turn around and impersonate the client back to the server. So even though the server is compromised, he's actually still there, right? So it's a little bit of a different than how you normally think about these things in the UC framework or in some other um, security models, right? There's a, there's, a, there's a server, he's running, he's there, and then this password file leaks, but the server is still there and is still, you know, has clients trying to log into it. And you want to say that it's difficult for the client to, to be able to log in. And you can see that just given this information, phi zero and C, you don't get phi one. And for this particular protocol, you see you have to, at least the way the protocol is written, you have to kind of take something that was given to you, this, this element V is given to you, this group element V is given to you by the server as kind of a challenge. And you have to take that and do something and then raise that to the power of phi one. And, and the, of course the proof boils down to showing that, you know, you can only do that if you've actually plugged the right password into this, into this, um, into this uh, function F, which we model as a random Oracle. So that means you to, even after you get this information, you're gonna have to like plug in um, at some point in time, either before or after the server compromise, to, you're going to have to go through your dictionary and try all possible passwords, plug them into here until you hit the right one in order to get this guy. We have a question on, on Zula here. Um, so uh, Kevin asked, uh, is the computational cost of this protocol the same as the original Spake 2 protocol? Um, I assume asking about the overhead of the key confirmation flows. Well, you can see here, well, actually uh, everything in blue here is, is new, right? So there's a, there's like a, there's like, um, uh, well, actually this is the same, except this was just a pi. And then these two, this, this is the new computational part here. And then in addition to that, 
there's the key confirmation. So the key confirmation, so when you do all of this, actually, I didn't like write down the whole protocol here. There's gonna be three flows like this between the client and the server. There's gonna be a U and then a V and a, a key confirmation uh, message one, and then a key confirmation message two that goes back. So from the point of view of communication, there's gonna be an extra round of communication um, and even a little bit more latency on top of that because these two messages could be exchanged simultaneously. For the protocol I actually analyzed, there's like three flows that have to happen in order. Uh, these, these key confirmation compu messages though are very cheap to compute. They're, they don't involve any public key um, operations. So the, computationally, you have these two additional um, exponentiations and then um, a couple of extra or one extra flow. So um, I guess one other uh, question. So you, um, you mentioned that you proved security in the UC model um, uh, and there's also BPR model. So what are some of the advantages of proving security in the, in the UC model? That's a good question. Um, so first of all, for this problem of looking at asymmetric PAKE, uh, where you have, to, you have to have a definition that somehow captures the notion that after a server compromise, you still have to carry out uh, um, an offline uh, dictionary attack. There's one or two papers in the literature that, that try to look at the BPR model and do something with that, but it's just, there's no, but there's no really established or nice definition that I know of that that uh, does this in the uh, that that um, that captures asymmetric security in the BPR model. So that was one reason that I I, I gravitated towards the UC, and UC also has other um, advantages as as well. One, uh, you know, it 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 more it more cleanly models dependencies between passwords, that passwords are not modeled as, as random things. They're just modeled as arbitrarily chosen objects that uh, can be dependent on one another. Um, um, so th those are the, I mean, th th those, that was a secondary condition, consideration. If, if there had been a clean, if the clean and accepted BPR like model for asymmetric PAIC, I might have considered that as well, but there wasn't one. Uh, we have uh, one more question um, by Markov. Markov asks, you mentioned standardization. Did the proof have any effect on the standard? Um, if not, would you like it to have an effect on the standard? I, I, I'm, it may have, I haven't looked at uh, there's after I released an initial version of this, it did have there may have been some updates to the standard, but I'm not sure. Maybe not. Uh, the 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 standards already had the key confirmation in it, by the way, so that was a, a good. <laughs> and um, one thing that a, when, one thing that's interesting, and some other authors have noticed this in related protocols, that when you uh, add key confirmation, you can actually get rid of this B and you can all get rid of everything that involves B actually. So the protocol becomes a little bit simpler um, when you add key confirmation. And I think if, um, you know, if this proof of security had been available at the start of that standardization process, maybe, uh, you know, that could have been um, um, simplified uh, there. Um, yeah, uh, and also there are uh, some, I've looked at the standard and in fact, in, 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 I, in the paper, I actually analyze and prove the standard as written or at least the generalization of the standard that includes the standard as a special case. Um, there's, a, there's, some, there's some stuff in the standard that probably shouldn't really be there in my opinion, but it doesn't hurt anything either. But um, um, so it could have been simplified in some other ways. Like the way they do the key confirmation in the in the standard is overly complicated. I, in my opinion, it doesn't need to be there, but it doesn't detract from the proof of security either. It's kind of overkill. Uh, Frank Davis asks, have you considered verifying the protocol using CPSA? Um, I haven't, I mean, 
I think <laughs> I think these UC proofs of security are really are really error prone. I mean, I hope my my proof is nice and valid and everything, but you know, just even writing down one of these simulators is a is a couple of pages of of mind numbing text, and if you translated that into uh, you know, code, it would be, you know, at least several hundred lines of code just to write down the simulator and then, you know, a machine validated proof that the simulator worked would be great. I mean, but, um, I, I wouldn't know how to, I don't, I don't know how to use these tools myself. So, um, maybe that's a, a project for, for somebody else to look into. So we had another question from, uh, Joel on, uh, Zulip, uh, um, asking about uh, how uh, the server is driving the session key if it doesn't know pi here. I think um, I the slide here. Oh, that's because uh, there's a typo in my slide. Um, yeah, uh, that's a very good point. Um, I think we just put in, I have to double check how this works. We, we, I think we just put in these, no, we put in, uh, okay. Let me let me look that up. I think well, we just put this. Uh, I think phi zero, right? So mm -hmm. basically, phi zero, for the most part, plays the role of of pi. So phi zero goes into there. Boy, I hope that typo didn't isn't in the paper as well. Um, hopefully not. But it's this should be phi zero. I think. Let me double check what's in the paper. I I have um I have one more uh, questions about this um the the password hardening um how much does this does this um uh, kind of what's the what's the effect on a on a practical attack so I, I kind of I compromise this this password file I can't do pre computation um does this kind of does this make it infeasible to compromise all passwords in the file or well you there is a, this, so or, this particular or, protocol is subject to a pre-computation attack right if you have a dictionary yeah. from which all passwords are found right then you can go ahead and and compute uh, these values for all different pi ahead of time although because we pass in the identities here of the client and the server that's only going to be directed at a particular client server pair if you do that on, on Monday and on Tuesday, you break into the server, then you can immediately, uh, you know, just look up this guy in your table and see, right? So there is a pre-computation. That's what this, these newer protocols like opaque protect against that. So you still have to carry out an uh, offline dictionary attack. This, the weaker and older definitions that I'm working with uh, just don't say when that offline dictionary attack occurs before or after the server compromise. I don't know if I answered your question. Um, I, I think my, my question was was actually to, to which extent does it does it matter whether this happens before or after? Um, well, um, I don't know. I mean, just you know, um, I don't know. I mean, if you if you does does it matter? I mean, it gives the adversary more flexibility, I guess. Um, to, to, to do it ahead of time, you know, he can do it ahead of time and then break into the server. I, I'm not sure, you know, in all honesty, I, I don't know, I, I don't know, I'm not sure. Maybe somebody who's a advocate for, for a strong asymmetric pick should jump in here and give the strongest uh, argument uh, for this. Okay. Um, uh, Mike asks a question. Mike asks, pre post compromise is an analog of storing salted residue. Yeah. yeah, if you go back to the, right. So if you go back to, ah, yeah, right. that's a good point. Yeah, if you go back to the, you know, the, the original salted password protocols that people used, those those did give security in, in, without, it, without, there was no pre-computation attacks, right? You'd have to wait and get the salt and then you could start your, your, um, your dictionary attack only after you you get the salt. So in some sense, you know this type of protocol 
doesn't get back, you know, a protocol like this, you lose all of that, right? So like nobody would ever even want to use a protocol like this probably because of the server compromise problem. A protocol like this, you get back some, but not all of the nice properties, uh, but, but, and then a, a, a more, mo mo more uh, modern protocols like OPIC give you even stronger properties. So I should uh, throw out there, uh, since we're a few minutes uh, ahead of yeah, schedule, I, if we I've have questions for any other papers, we can take those now as well. Uh, um, yeah, so any questions about any paper in the session, feel free okay. to- Okay, thanks Joel. Okay, oh, Joel just uh, sent me a message saying that, uh, that the typo isn't in the in the ePrint version of the paper, so. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what about the Springer version? Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, Springer, I don't know. Hopefully not. It yeah, we'll see. One. I'll double check that. It's too late now, anyway, in the Springer version. Okay. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks for all the good questions. If there are no other questions. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions on Zilla or on Zoom's chat, uh, um, but uh, I guess we can uh, um, virtually thank all the speakers for, uh, for great talks. <laughs> yeah, it was a really nice session, thanks. Um, and thanks for the discussion. Um, then I guess this will be followed by a social break, is that correct?